Um, which I don't know if everyone hears, but it's now officially started recording. This is the second part of a two part series. So I am wondering if by folks raising their hands who was here last week with us, Last week was getting to know our neighbors, um, an, an introduction to LGBTQ identities. Um, I know quite a lot of people probably weren't there, but I would encourage you if you have the time to watch the recording. Uh, it is something that no matter how many years, so I've been doing these trainings for over a decade, and there's always more to know whether you're an ally or a part of the LGBTQ plus community. So I would encourage y'all to watch it if you did not. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about equitable practices for housing and homeless services providers. And so the if there's any words that maybe are new to you, so it's a good way to uh, kind of get um, a list of things that you may want to look up or learn in last week's webinar. And um, we'll go ahead and get started. It is a pretty packed agenda today. And so I'll take questions throughout, but we'll, we'll kind of maintain a pretty steady pace because there's a lot to get to. Since we don't have that many people that were here last week, I'll do a quick intro to me. Uh, my name is Sam, my pronouns are they, them, and I am the Director of Development and Communications at Texas Homeless Network, but have been working in the field for uh, over 15 years at this point. Uh, I have worked in everything from the National Dating Abuse Helpline to overnight victim services for domestic violence shelter, supportive housing, um, technical assistance on the statewide level for sexual assault and domestic violence, both in Texas and in North Carolina. Um, and so I kind of have that full range of working everything from overnight direct services to daytime direct services to literally living on the premise in supportive housing as a resident advisor. Uh, so those are kind of the lenses that bring me to this work and not only thinking about our job as folks that are providing care for our neighbors. Um, I'm a social worker. I have my, I have associates, bachelor and graduate degree in social work. So I was, I poor committed all the way through. Um, and so it's just helpful to provide that context for my lens on this work. Um, also saying one of the things that I said last week, just recognizing how many people didn't come last week, because it is my personal lens, because it is my training today, uh, these are, it's a little bit different than last week because we're talking more about practice, but it is still coming from me I don't speak for the entire community of LGBTQ plus folks. Um, the other thing I'll say is I also am going to say LGBTQ, which is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer as the acronym. Uh, I'm going to leave out the plus. I'm not gonna do the full acronym of the beautiful, robust, expansive identities of the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, and that's not because I don't love and adore all of our community, it's because it's just easier for me to say over and over again. I'll also be short shortening transgender to trans for the same reason, it's just easier for me to say. Um, we will go ahead and look at what we're gonna learn today. So we'll go over the foundation of why we're doing this topic today, where we need to start LGBTQ inclusive language practices, data collection and confidentiality, LGBTQ inclusive facility practices, harassment policies, privacy and safety practices, and building beyond. Uh, plus a 
hopefully a tiny bit of wrap up in Q and A time, but it truly is, we are going to talk about so much today. So we'll see how much time we have at the end for that. Um, before we go into it, the same thing we did last week, we're gonna do a little bit of grounding. I think it is helpful for us to, last week was about what we were thankful for that day, which was really beautiful. Today, we're gonna think about when the last time we felt really safe and welcomed by a provider. Um, recognizing, depending on your identity, uh, you may have not had a recent experience. And so if not by a provider, in what circumstance did you feel safe and welcomed? Um, so if you feel comfortable to share, or maybe just sit with for a second an example of maybe entering a doctor's office and um, their intake form or seeing pictures on the wall or even just the way they talk to you or the pace they held the conversation. Um, what are things that you saw a provider emulate that, that made you feel safe and welcome? And while it's being recorded, I won't say any names out loud of anyone asking a question or, or stating anything. So your answers won't be recorded. I know that's a bigger one to type out. Yeah, I love to see LGBTQ reading material in waiting rooms. Um, pronouns as an option on intake forms. One of the things that I, the reason this is a reflection piece is also to ground us in what is really hard times in the world, in our lives, personally, professionally, globally. Um, Mr. Rogers, Loki is uh, who I want to be when I grow up. Who I, who I, my hero. Um, and one of the one of his like silly quotes is "Look for the helpers." Um, and I just think about how many times, in these moments where I feel seen, when I feel safe, when I feel welcomed, not only paying a lot of gratitude to that person, but walking away and thinking of how can I offer that same thing to someone else. And so as we go through this, that's really the goal of today. That's really the goal of why this exists is to create that same safe and welcomed environment, um, particularly for our most marginalized clients that oftentimes don't feel safe and welcomed. So that's what we're gonna do today. We'll start with one little other caveat. Well, two things. Since y'all weren't here last week, I have the privilege of working from home today, which means I have my wonderful dog, who is my best friend as a coworker. He very rarely barks, but he may bark. So he is present, just so you know. Um, the second thing is, is as a person training, if you've ever done a training or done a presentation for school, um, sometimes you just have to like find a theme. And so my theme is we are building a, a shelter slash building together. So every step of the way, we're gonna add on a level and it's really cheesy. So I hope it makes you smile every time we enter a new level because I just thought it was incredibly cheesy, but very fun to do. So we are going to start with the foundation. <laughs> Um, which, yeah, I'm very excited about. I just think it's so cute. <laughs> so for the foundation, what we wanna talk about is essentially why as homeless service providers or helping professionals in general, we wanna think about this. One of the reasons being the discrimination in homeless services is well-documented and is, is something that we sometimes have a hard time accepting and recognizing as, as folks in the field. So 
we it was found that uh, one in four trans people reported experiencing sexual assault perpetrated by staff or other shelter res residents um, within the shelter. Uh, this was from a 2012 study. It's the it was the biggest study done on this scale for homeless services. Uh, also, 30% of homeless transgender individuals report being turned away from shelter due to being trans. So. Those are both really staggering statistics when we're talking about our agencies. There's a lot more that we talked about last week of the reasons this matters overall, but when we're talking about entering and creating equitable services, 30% of shelters alone aren't doing that for trans folks, um, and sometimes unknowingly not realizing how much they're not doing that for folks. In response, HUD created the Equal Access and Gender Identity Rules. We're not going to get in all of the details of it, but the first Equal Access um, in Housing uh, rule started in 2012. It essentially laid the groundwork to say that HUD uh, providers had to um, provide eligibility for housing regardless of someone's sexual orientation. Um, and kind of over the years, it's built on that. In 2016, they expanded it to include gender identity. Um, and that also includes real or perceived gender identity or sexuality as something that's covered. And that expands to uh, other programs within HUD that have the same requirements that essentially says, regardless of someone's gender identity, regardless of someone's sexuality, as HUD funded programs, um, which I think probably a lot of y'all as Balance of State uh, folks are, uh, that ends up being something that we, are beholden to as folks receiving HUD funding. Under the rules, kind of the broad stroke, big picture things, our programs must place individuals in accordance with their gender identity, regardless of their presentation, which we'll talk about. So if someone comes to your shelter, tells you their gender, you are not you you can't uh, legally require any proof of that individual's gender identity. So things like birth certificate or driver's license or a letter from the doctor or any other invasive thing as proof of the individual's gender identity. We talked a lot last week about why um, someone having to do those things are are incredibly harsh barriers. Um, and then that providers must update policies and procedures to reflect those requirements and also post it publicly, um, which is one of the things that uh, folks often don't do, but is again, another really wonderful way to show that you're an affirming and inclusive uh, program. In addition, under the Fair Housing Act and HUD's rules, um, folks, uh, landlords or any housing provider can't discriminate um, against LGBTQ persons because of their real or perceived gender identity or any other reason that constitutes sex-based discrimination. Um, it's illegal to deny uh, someone housing because of HIV AIDS status. Um, the same thing goes for FHA insured mortgage. Folks are not able to deny mortgage based on those, which uh, there's lots of loopholes why that still happens. Um, essentially, all of these create a lot of the things we're going to talk about as best practices. The one that we're going to talk about a lot today is the last one, which is prohibited. Um, activities are being that homeless facilities can't segregate or isolate trans individuals solely based on their gender identity. Um, so we'll talk about that and what it looks like in practice. Now, we're going, after this, we're also going to provide a lot of resources and tools HUD came out with 
uh, a new version of an equal access assessment that is very, very helpful to go through as a program and see how you're doing with equal access. But because we only have an hour and a half together and there's a lot to cover, we're not going to go through the full, I don't know, 40 pages of it. We're going to talk about kind of the starting steps that we should be doing and thinking about. And also noting that regardless of if it's mandated or not, so if you're on this call and you are not HUD funded, um, if you're on this call and you don't know if you're HUD funded, this is still relevant information because regardless, we shouldn't have to be mandated to be good neighbors to our neighbors and good service providers to all people, particularly those most marginalized. And so regardless of these rulings, um, we can use the best practices, we can use the assessment, we can have a look at how we're doing as programs. Um, but we really should be caring about this regardless of how we are funded. So we're going to look at the materials, which is essentially where we need to start. So on an individual level, one of the ways that we can, as uh, providers, get started is getting more familiar and comfortable with LGBTQ identities. Uh, that's doing things like last week's training. That's also even if you feel like you're already a really rad ally, um, learning more about identities, learning more about how to feel comfortable having conversations. So being able to uh, not feel nervous about talking about trans folks or talking to trans folks, um, being able to feel comfortable saying uh, lesbian out loud or <laughs> talking about these things in a way that when you meet a client, you feel familiar, comfortable, and affirming yourself. That also includes interrogating and owning our own internal biases. And so that's looking at um, the ways in which we may uh, unintentionally do micro or macro aggressions towards people in our work because we all have them um, and just really taking time to have that self-reflection. There's lots of tools available. I know Billy will know well, but Harvard has a wonderful tool that um, maybe Billy could find real quick, but it, they, there's implicit bias tests available in which you can uh, help research places like Harvard and look at your own biases and look at your own implicit biases that kind of um, guide us through our work. Also creating external accountability of other ways that maybe it's a coworker or maybe it's a loved one that kind of keeps us on our toes. Um, and then the last thing is becoming familiar with your agency and COC policies. So knowing your agency's and your COC stance on what are best practices, what do you need to abide by, what are the discrimination policies we're gonna talk about? Because you don't wanna wait until something happens to know these things, you wanna know them uh, before. On an agency level, you're going to want to look at how you're supporting your LGBTQ staff. Um, I, this is kind of tangential to equal access, but if we aren't doing good by our staff um, who are paid to be there, what are we doing for our clients who need our services? So things like looking at employee benefits and protection policies, uh, thinking about things like health-related benefits for your uh, your trans employees or adoption policies or um, if your bereavement policy only covers blood, blood family members when we know that a large percentage of LGBTQ people don't have blood family, um, blood family in like the U.S. cultural sense. Uh, when you're looking at all of those employee benefits and policies, how are you actually making sure that they're inclusive? 
also having internal policies for harassment and discrimination and being really clear about them on onboarding and ongoing. Um, reviewing onboarding and training materials to actually set up your staff for success. And so having them complete maybe the training that we recorded last week for LGBTQ identities in this training and having it be a part of their onboarding so you set them up for success um, and have them have the most knowledge possible so that they don't cause harm. And then creating an ongoing training schedule for continuing education for all marginalized identities. So that includes LGBTQ identities, but also thinking intersectionally about all of the other identities uh, that, that we interact with as service providers or hold ourselves and how we can continue that education throughout the year with our staff, volunteers, and board. Also, as an agency, you're gonna wanna audit all of your client documents that is doing, and this is in the HUD Equal Access Assessment, is really helpful. There's also other ones that I'll send you all. Um, but you're gonna wanna audit those client documents for things like ensuring there's LGBTQ inclusive language on intake forms, that there's gender neutral dress codes and things like shelters, um, that you have a clear confidentiality policy that is also inclusive and respectful to LGBTQ identities, and that you also have a clear feedback policy and complaint policy that helps clients actually share their experiences and recommendations. How many times I have contracted with a shelter and they'll say that a client has never complained uh, a trans or LGBTQ client um, because one, either their process is way too complicated or the they're not given an opportunity to give just feedback. It's only a complaint process. So if they aren't highly traumatized, you're not getting the feedback of just the slight improvements you can make uh, to your shelter or your program overall. You're also gonna wanna look at the kind of the external lens of what it looks like when a client or neighbor looks at your program. So uh, reviewing your agency website, I looked at a lot of uh, attendees programs uh, across the state and many of them don't have anything that clearly states that they're an affirming shelter our program. Um, and so having just a rainbow heart at the bottom of your footer of your page or on the services page that says that you're affirming inclusive care practice. Um, thinking about where it's listed so that an LGBTQ client knows that you provide services also having your social media accounts reflect that as well. And it's not just uh, happy Pride Month to folks, but it's not just during Pride Month that you're doing a post. It's throughout the year that you're incorporating, um, whether it's imagery of um, LGBTQ folks in your graphics. Um, one of the most beautiful things that I feel the most seen in is when I see a non-binary trans queer person on a post that's not even related to gender identity or sexuality. So I see visibly someone that I assume to be queer or trans, and it's actually just a post about like a community picnic or you know the the resource fair that they're having. So it's not even just about gender identity only, it's the ways that we can normalize just the spectrum of experiences and people that exist in our community. And the same notion for brochures and posters of the same thing of having visual cues that um, you as an agency uh, are committed to equal access and equity in your program thinking about the language you use. So if 
you are a provider that focuses on domestic violence survivors, having language that doesn't always gender a survivor one way or the other. Um, and then also doing news articles, op-eds, and blogs that speak to the intersection and maybe include voices um, of, of LGBTQ folks. You're also gonna wanna audit your projects. <laughs> so you're gonna wanna look at your data collection standards and make sure that the data that all of your staff are collecting actually um, is being collected, that we're asking questions, that we're opening doors for folks to ask for services or tell us about their identities and that we're marking them correctly and that we're not just assuming things like gender, sexuality, or race, ethnicity, all of the things. You're also gonna wanna look at your privacy and policy standards uh, for internal and external purposes, the confidentiality practice standards, and then also your harassment and policy and the violation of the harassment and policy procedures. Um, all of those help create the container that make sure not only that you're documenting that you are serving these folks. The other thing we hear a lot is we don't actually have LGBTQ folks in your community. When I can guarantee you, um, Texas has per capita the highest amount of trans folks in our state. Um, it is the fact that our providers may not actually be asking or not be giving the cues in which someone feels safe to disclose that they're trans. And the same thing goes for sexual orientation. And on the same note, if you're, if you're asking those things that you're ensuring that you have really solid privacy and policy standards and confidentiality practice standards that give folks all of the protection they need when they're offering that information to you. You're also gonna wanna audit your referrals. We talked about this last week, but this ends up being a really um, missed target for a lot of programs where you are offering LGBTQ clients the same referrals you're offering to your cisgender heterosexual clients. And what that can do, what we talked about last, last week, is we're still having 30% of um, counseling professionals discriminating, right? So we need to make sure, and we have over 60% of trans and LGBTQ folks not wanting to seek medical care a year um, due to discrimination. So we're gonna wanna create a referral list that is specifically that we know our medical professionals that are affirming, housing projects that are affirming, um, name and gender marker resources. Uh, there's a lot of federal, and well, not a lot, There's there should be way more, but there are grants and other resources for care so that they can get funding to support some of the things. There's things like um, for trans men that may wanna bind their chest, there are, there's a program that offers um, essentially like a recycled free uh, binder program to, to give trans men those options or non-binary folks that want them as well. But having that list, it's a really great project for like a social work student, it's a really great project um, for maybe an LGBTQ or a DEI committee that you have at your agency to, to work on. Also, if you're in a city that has an LGBTQ center or um, a program, they probably already have one of these. And so just actually utilizing it and letting them know that, that it's something that you want to have access to. Speaking of the committees, you're really thinking about how do you keep all of those pieces and all of the pieces we're gonna talk about sustainable. One of the ways that we can show internally that we are committed to the work is having a committee that's dedicated 
to making sure we're hitting the markers not only on LGBTQ identities, and that all marginalized identities that we work with. Um, and so it's things like making sure that the, the referral list gets updated once a year or helping connect uh, the program to opportunities to network with the community, but having invested staff, volunteers, or board members to help maintain the work that we're gonna talk about today. So now we're gonna move on to the first floor, which is LGBTQ inclusive language. So some of the do's and don'ts for intakes. We're gonna talk first about the things that we do um, when we are first meeting a client. So some of the things we don't wanna do is we don't wanna assume someone's gender or sexuality. So what we may do instead is use gender neutral language until they tell us more about themselves. Um, that includes when you're asking about partner or partners, relationship structure, their gender, their sexuality, um, not saying miss or ma'am or sir, avoid honor in it, honorifics, um, one of the things that I always say is um, words don't matter as much as your actions. And so if you're showing respect by what you're doing, you don't need honorifics. Um, I know it's a very hard thing to break, but also even outside of clients, it's the one thing I would say don't do at the grocery store or Whataburger or anywhere is just leave the honorifics um, as a non-binary person that uh, doesn't identify as male or female. It is the one thing that uh, makes me not want to go anywhere is how much I get misgendered just by a sir or a man, um, depending on how I'm presenting for the day. Uh, so it's the easiest way to just really care about people. You don't want to ask invasive questions about someone's body, particularly when it's not relevant to anything you're, do you're doing. Um, if it is something that you need to know for whatever reason, offer explanations and context. So that includes asking questions about someone's gender. We'll talk about it in a second, but giving an explanation. So saying that your shelter um, is separated into genders. And so you're wanting to know which shelter that they feel most aligned with. And therefore you would like to know what gender they identify as or asking about their sexuality and seeing if saying that you have services or recommendations for resources um, if they're interested. You also don't want to out someone's sexual orientation or trans identity um, after an intake. So just because someone discloses it doesn't mean that they want the rest of the staff to know, doesn't mean that they want the rest of your program to know. Um, and that also goes for personal life too. It's never, no matter if it's a lover, a friend, or a family member, um, unless they uh, give you explicit consent, uh, it's not appropriate to, to tell someone's sexual orientation or trans identity. You also want to mirror the language. We'll talk about this a lot, but and we talked about it last week too, but one of the things we'll do, particularly we see it a lot with really, really uh, passionate allies is uh, they'll, they'll want to like show their knowing. And so they may, if I say that I'm gay and the definition of gay uh, traditionally has been men attracted to other men, someone may, may go, oh, well, don't, why don't you identify as lesbian? Well, if I just called, if I just told you I'm gay, just use my language. We're not here to try to like, <laughs> to, to find someone else. Um, so if they use the word queer, and that's a, a word that maybe you're not super comfy with, um, 
it's still really good to offer that same weird language. We do it with a lot of different practices of when someone is offering feelings, we mirror the feelings back to them too, right? Um, so it just lets someone know that you see them and you hear them and that you actually support and respect their identity. So I would love for folks to put in the chat what an example of an inclusive intake would look like. Uh, so if you were to introduce yourself and ask someone else their name and pronouns, um, how would you say it? There's going to be a lot more uh, interactions, so I'm hoping that y'all will uh, not have me just talk at you for the rest of the time. So I just got, hi, my name is, and I use he and pronouns. What is your name and your preferred pronouns? Does someone have? Another one they want to share. And my name is, and I use he, him pronouns. What is your name and what pronouns do you use? What is your preference for how we address you? Okay, so it, this is kind of like a hodgepodge of what y'all just said. So. The example is, hi, my name is Sam. My pronouns are they, them. I'll be helping you with your intake. Before we get started with your paperwork, I would love to know what name you go by and what pronouns you use so I can refer to you correctly while we while we work together today. Um, so it's a little bit longer, which again, also y'all are typing on the spot. The nice thing is, is it still provides context for why we need it like uh, someone offered in the chat. Um, it also gives the space for the name as well, because we'll talk about it, but what name they go by versus what name that you'll put in the system may vary. Um, and then the pronouns, just making sure that we're, we're asking them so that we can refer to them correctly. Most folks, we 99% of the time, we would just say, what are your pronouns? Because usually pronouns, unless folks use multiple pronouns, so if they use she, they, or all pronouns, et cetera, um, there really are just their pronouns. So if you have pronouns, everyone has pronouns, that's I don't need to get on that soapbox today, but everyone we know in this room, unless they are the percentage of the population that does not use pronouns, but if you go into a meeting or someone refers to you, you have pronouns that feel the best when you hear them said to you, those are your pronouns. Um, just like your gender is just your gender. So just asking them what their pronouns are is really helpful. When you're asking someone, when you're doing an intake, what their sexual orientation or gender is, what would you say? And I would love new folks. This is a much quieter group than last week. Um, so I would love folks that haven't put in the chat to say something.
And this is just helping us get our wheels turning. So these are things that we should, after today, be doing with every client, regardless of if we uh, think that they're LGBTQ or not. Um, it's normalizing these practices. Okay, so we have, I would say I have some questions to ask them and then show them the questions. So maybe showing them the intake form or what, what you're putting in the system. When we do ask, make sure that the individual doesn't feel like they have to answer it and be pre prepared why this is being asked that this information is used for a reason and will be kept private if you choose to answer. What is your sexual orientation and gender? Okay, thanks y'all, I appreciate a little bit more. I know it's a lot to try to type. Um, we'll have moments where folks can be unmuted today too, because I know that that also is a barrier. So this is an example. In an effort to match our clients with appropriate services, we ask these questions of everyone during their intake to better understand their needs. How would you identify, oops, that's a typo. How would you identify your sexual orientation or gender identity? And then one of the other questions you can really ask to expand on that is while you're working with us, are there any specific services you're wanting to support accessing in relation to your sexuality or gender? Again, that's a really, really, really wonderful way if you have that referrals resources ready to show that you affirm and support their identity. When we know that 60% of trans folks have not sought medical care, and those are folks that were most likely housed during that survey. Um, and we know that folks experiencing homelessness, those rates go up even higher. Asking them what services they may need, like STI checking or um, hormones or gynecological exam, all of the things to, the, to be able to connect them to services. Um, I think that y'all asked it. The only thing I would say is you should be asking it with every client. It's a really great way uh, to make sure that you're not assuming anything. Um, of course, it's always optional. That I think that that's something I'm probably, well, I am lacking in this example. Um, but it really does, we don't, I think a lot of the times we go, okay, we don't ask it every time. But the reason we don't ask it every time is because we're making assumptions um, or that someone's uncomfortable with LGBTQ identities. So, for doing an intake, we don't make a plan before asking the client. We'll talk about this quite a bit, but if we have an LGBTQ client, we do not have a recipe formula for how we deal with them as an organization. Um, we have options that we know are relevant and possible, um, but we don't have a cut a cut formula in which they don't have autonomy or choice. We don't segregate unless requested. Um, both of those things end up being things that we proactively think we're doing to ensure comfort, but what we're really doing is we're taking away autonomy and choice. Also with the segregation, it can a lot of the times out someone if they know that whatever room or whatever procedure as a shelter means that someone is LGBTQ. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you and all of your options are thinking about ways that you are protecting the uh, self-determination and the safety of, of someone. Um, you also don't want to ask without out without asking every time and so again like we just talked about we're not going to tell every staff member um because they potentially don't want every staff member to know um 
And we're also going to want to make sure that regardless of the person that we're going through the non discrimination policy. As someone who worked in shelters for years, I um, wish I could turn back time for the amount of times that I handed our policies and just had them sign because I was crunched for time um, without actually helping someone understand and feel safe in what our non-discrimination policies were. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But we really want to make sure that every client understands not only that they are not to be discriminated against, but as they enter our shelter and our services, whether it's support groups, housing, shelter, whatever program you're working with them on, that they know that you will not tolerate discrimination. Um, and that you stand with and for marginalized identities, including the LGBTQ plus community. The other piece um, that, so all of that a lot uh, is about how we do it, but as an agency overall, we also wanna think about our commitment to inclusive language beyond um, and so we're thinking about how we communicate with staff to ensure that LGBTQ inclusive language and programming is understood and held accountable on all levels of our care. So anyone interfacing with the agency knows and respects pronouns, um, knows and respects LGBTQ identities overall, whether that's a contractor, whether that's a volunteer, whether that's a board member, uh, whoever it is, but if they are interfacing with clients, or honestly, even if they're interfacing with staff for all of the reasons uh, for staff discrimination, that we hold that same standard that's consistent. For coordinated entry, we really want to make sure that that immediate assessment has LGBTQ inclusive language. So when they're picking up the phone or doing that intake, that they're not assuming gender, that they're not assuming relationship structure or the gender of someone that is in a relationship or family structure. We're having them avoid honorifics. We're making sure that they're doing as much LGBTQ inclusive language, that they're doing inclusive referrals and only sharing information about individuals that is absolutely necessary when making the referrals. Uh, and that they're listening to the client, clients and respecting their choices without uh, um, asking for proof of their eligibility. And so really having that first intake is so critical, so deeply critical to ensuring that LGBTQ clients get the care that they deserve and the care that they want. Um, and that they have all of the options available to them. For data collection and confidentiality, we're going to not assume people's identities. We're going to provide the why for why we're asking. We're going to ask and provide space for them to tell us, and then we're going to get consent and do check-ins when we do uh, feel a need to share their identity with anyone else. Some things about this is that clients may choose to disclose being trans or disclosing their sexual orientation at some projects within the community and not disclosing it at others. Um, for example, a trans person may uh, disclose at a health clinic, but may not disclose at a provider in which it's not relevant for the, the provider to know about their trans identity. Um, if they're providing different information, 
that is a-okay, you're going to enter that self, another typo, how disappointing. Um, you're gonna enter that self-reported information as directed by the client. Um, so it is still best practice data collection. You're listening to the client, you're getting that self-reported information, you're asking them. Um, if they do disclose that they're trans, it's also really best practice if they want that reflected in HMIS. So if you use HMIS, um, you want to make sure that they even want their trans identity reflected. So when we're talking about options, they disclose it, you affirm it, you say you're really glad to have them and that your services, you have XYZ services available for them. As you go through the intake, you want to know if it's something that they want reflected in the system and kind of explain to them um, what, what that information is used for and if they don't want it in there, what they would want in there instead. Um, for examples, like a transgender, trans man may be a trans man and he may want you to know but he may wanna be reflected as a man um, in HMIS. Or he may be a trans man that was assigned female at birth and want female um, because honestly, for whatever reason, we don't even need to know. He just tells us what he wants in the system and then that's what we do. Um, when we're doing all of this data collection, we're gonna do everything we can to make sure that all of the information regarding sex assigned at birth is confidential and that we're keeping it private. Um, and that is not only just private within our system, but private within the community. So this is a moment in which I'm going to ask two people to unmute um, and go through this scenario together um, to give me a break to drink water and then also just have two different voices. Um, if folks would want to raise their hand and we'll pick the first two people. I can't remember the gender identities of this first example, but it, it was, really- It was matter. Jay and something. Jay and Mark, but I think Jay is not binary if I remember this example right. I can practice, I've practiced this at least three times and I still no avail. If so, can, folks could raise their hand, that would be real rad. Yeah, because I don't know who to, I don't know who to unmute if you don't raise your hands. Billy, I'm looking at you. <laughs> I'd love for it to not just have to always be a team <laughs> staff. This is hopefully other people on the other side are listening um, and willing. Thank you, Billy. There's going to be multiple examples, y'all. I think me and Billy can take this first one. Okay. Uh, Billy, so, can you talk? Um, it, Craig, if you want to read the setting and be Jay, and then Billy, you can be Mark. Got it. So okay. our setting is, are you there? Okay. <clears throat> our setting is a large urban shelter who uses mass check-in procedures that incorporate swipe cards or other methods to gain, to quickly assign an individual a bed. Jay enters a small men's congregate shelter and walks up to the front desk. The front desk staff person, Marks, Mark greets Jay. Hi, can I help you? Yes, I need a place to sleep tonight. I've been here before. Let me check your record in HMIS. You should look under Jason Smith. I'm using my birth name, Jason. I found your record. Do you want me to go by Jay in the system? Yes, that would be great. Can you also change my gen my gender to non-binary? Absolutely. And which pronouns do you use? They, them. Mark makes a note. <laughs> you may remember, 
Our sleeping arrangement provides a cot in a large single with 20 male clients, and we have shared sh and we have shared showers and bathrooms. We have a non-harassment policy, which I will discuss in a minute. But do you have any concerns about this arrangement? Since you are non-binary, you are eligible for services at this shelter or the women's shelter, depending on where you feel more comfortable and safe. I can try to connect you with them if you want. No, I want to stay here tonight if that's okay. Mark accepts Jane to the shelter and discusses the non-harassment policy. <laughs> I know the italicized is weird, but it's like hard to switch between listening and reading. So, <laughs> hey, could y'all hear my sound effects? Can you hear me on the keyboard? I was trying. <laughs> <laughs> Are you pretending to type it? Yeah, I'm really disappointed <laughs> that you couldn't hear that sound effect because it was I was very much in in my method. So I love that. Thank you, Billy. Okay, so this first one I'm going to go over what went right, and then the next ones will have um, other folks be able to to chime in. But I think looking at this one, the things that went right is. Mark for sure demonstrated so much respect and so much comfort. You could even tell Billy uh, is a wonderful person and ally, but just doesn't hesitate or pause and knows the questions to ask. Um, Mark adhered by HUD data gender element policies around how um, he put it into the system. He makes sure Jane knows that they can access whatever shelter feels most closely aligned with their gender as a non-binary client. And so just looking at that, particularly with shelters that um, are male, female, non-binary folks aren't excluded. They are by HUD standards given the right to choose whichever shelter aligns best with their gender identity regardless of presentation, um, it's where they feel most safe and feel most aligned. And we're allowing them that self-determination. So Mark offering them both options, regardless of how they're dressed that day, regardless of how their hair is done, regardless of who they are, um, they're non-binary and they get that choice. So we have another example that is two people. Um, I would love for other people to raise their hand. It's a shorter example. If other folks would be willing. Jordan is one. Do I have another one? I'm looking. Jordan, you've got mic rights now. Okay. Yeah, I just didn't want to unmute myself. To <laughs> <my name. laughs> Anyone else want to volunteer, please? Uh, thank you, Tammy. I can cover the next one if we need to. I don't want us to run out of time. Yeah, you know, I was just open. Um, okay, next one, Jordan, how about you read the setting and then the Travis, so the italicized piece and then Travis's answer. Okay, setting. A large urban shelter houses more than 200 men in a single dormitory. The local community requires that the shelter check every resident's identification. Travis stands in line outside the shelter and notices a posted sign on the wall stating that ID is required to use the shelter. Travis does not have the resources or help to change his ID, which lists him as a female. Brian, the staff person checking in clients, greets Travis upon entry. ID, please. <laughs> Excuse me. Travis hands over the ID. Brian looks at the ID and sees that the gender marker on the ID does not match Travis's appearance, but that it is a photo of Travis. Brian directs Travis to the assigned bed. Later in the evening, Brian, ensuring no other clients are within earshot, follows up with Travis. 
You're all set, but I wanted to let you know that we have a staff member who can help if you want to change that information on your ID card. You just let me know. Maybe. I'll think about it. And see. Hey, hey, hey. Just for everyone. Or Tony's. I don't know what that thing is. Okay. <laughs> 10 out of 10 performance. Okay. So what do we feel like went right with this scenario? <laughs> no, what you just typed, Billy, but I love it. Do we, why, what kind of staff supported that non discrimination and respect for the individualities and confidentiality? So, for sure, nothing was assumed. Okay, we're gonna <laughs> feel like it's a really quiet group. So I'll go into what went right. Um, Brian accepts the ID without calling attention to it. So Travis was in line with other clients present. And so Brian noticed the gender marker difference, um, didn't say anything about it, correctly admits the client to the project, um, even if Travis's uh, marker gender marker on the id didn't match the current gender expression um because again noting that records um that a client's sex assigned at birth i.e what's probably on travis's card or well not probably was on travis's card um doesn't be isn't a reason to decline services to an eligible client so it truly has no bearing on whether or not Tra Travis can access the services. And Brian did the right thing of doing the follow-up and seeing if Travis would like that change and also not pressing it, saying it's available. And maybe Travis doesn't have the emotional, the spoons, the energy, the time, the want to change it or any other reason. So. The third floor is LGBTQ inclusive facilities. We're looking at our individual steps first. And so we as uh, helping professionals, we can, if it's permissible, which hopefully is by your agency, you can add pronouns to your name badge. You can add an LGBTQ flag or ally pin uh, to your lanyard or your name badge or wherever you want. And you can add a safe space sign to your workspace area if you have one, or even just adding one if you are like a roving staff or um, a community outreach worker and you're on the in the field a lot, having a sticker on your clipboard um, or somewhere present where <laughs> you kind of are doing your walking signage that says you are uh, an affirming person. You're also going to want to cultivate LGBTQ inclusive spaces. So um, it was talked about earlier about the medical provider that had um, reading materials that were LGBTQ inclusive, having books and media selections in your hangout areas for clients, having artwork up. Um, that even if it's not just LGBTQ, it's, it doesn't have to be a rainbow flag. It can be um, pictures of uh, different family dynamics or different couplings or different expressions of uh, gender presentation. Having bathroom signs that are gender inclusive. Having dorm and sleep area covers that aren't gendered of having the pink rooms be for the girls and the blue rooms being for the boys. Um, having outdoor decorations so that uh, the community knows when they're driving by that it is uh, a safe spot. And that can be things like rainbow flags. 
And then also having those displayed policies, one, because it's mandated, and two, because it's very helpful for clients to know and be able to reference. Some of the other accommodations are preparing hygiene options for clients, so establishing a single-use bathroom for clients um, is really helpful, and so we'll talk about the options for that, but that can be a staff bathroom, that can be a multi-stall bathroom that you turn into and add a lock to that ends up being a single-use bathroom, creating a consistent interval schedule for safety, um, for showering options, uh, so that folks can take a shower privately. And then also preparing room options for clients and giving them those options upon intake. So having rooms that are close to staff. So if um, they want to be as close to staff for harassment as policy or having ones with locking doors or um, having an individual room if a lot of them are shared dorm style or open, open space. When we're looking at harassment, the things we can do as an individual is we don't want to glaze over an anti-discrimination policy. We want to make sure every client understands that you prioritize the safety of all people. Um, and that can be things like giving examples of what it looks like to report harassment in relatable ways, not just reading the form, and giving them and highlighting them where the email is to reach out to or showing them the HR or admin staff uh, office if, if you're in um, a community program in which you have offices close by um, as you give them a tour of a facility if they're coming in for counseling or shelter or whatever they're there for. And then also following through with harassment policies that are uh, really truly cohesively held across the team. And so having the procedures ready and understood and that everyone is actually acting upon them so that there's not biases that leak from staff member to staff member. And then also being available um, so that if someone is having something happen that you are um, present and available to help them. On an agency level, that looks like creating a standard for when discrimination occurs. There's lots of good examples we'll provide after, um, and HUD also has, but including specific behaviors that violate standards. So things like language or physical actions or nonverbal intimidation having a plan for escalating corrective actions. Um, so what it looks like when violation of those standards happen and the ways that we try to do, hopefully in all of our programs, some level of restorative justice and having all of our actions that are corrective focused on the aggressor, not the person that's experiencing their harassment. Because particularly if someone continues to disrespect or harass an LGBTQ person, you're going to have them stay away from the client. You're not going to have the client have to stay away from them. You're going to potentially move them farther away from the client they're harassing, not move the client, right? We're essentially offering the most comfort and stability to the person experiencing the harassment and we're doing the things we need to to create changes that need to happen to protect that client. And if all else fails, that we actually remove the harassing resident and put them, or not put them, <laughs> refer them to a program that maybe offers different services or give them uh, other opportunities uh, that are outside of our current shelter. But in no instances should we ever remove the harassed client unless it's by their request. And then also, even if you're not HUD funded, having your anti-discrimination policy posted on your website and then physically throughout your facilities 
is really helpful, um, particularly having ones that are actually sample language that folks understand. Um, and then having the it, it throughout the shelter so that it's not just in the check-in, check-out spot or where all of the other OSHA and stuff exists, but that it's it's places where people can reference it ongoing. Um, we also may oftentimes provide folks a written copy so that they have um, an example that they can hold on to. And then also having it as a part of kind of our, our area for the check-in check-out spot. Um, our next example, um, I'm just gonna have for time, um, Billy, if you're willing, uh, Billy and Jordan do. Are y'all down? How about Craig and Hope? Sorry, I said yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah, Billy and Jordan. Sorry, Jordan. Okay. We're waiting for Craig and you. Sorry, <laughs> Sam. <laughs> <laughs> whoever wants to do it, whoever wants to be Trish. There, oh, actually there's three, yeah. So there's Trish, Alex, and Susan. So whoever maybe wants to be Susan, um, let's have Hope be Susan, and you can do the setting, the italicized. Um, and then Billy, you can be Alex, and then Jordan, you can be Trish. Cool. Cool. All right. Uh, setting is a five bed transitional living program for young adults ages 18 to 24. Alex 18 is questioning their gender identity and has chosen to use the pronouns they, them, their to indicate not being aligned with either end of the gender spectrum. Their gender expression is neutral and the housemates have have been giving them a hard time. Staff member Susan has her office door open and hears the following conversation. Alex, why were you in the girl's bathroom? You dress and act like a guy. None of us even want you around. Whatever. I can be where I want. Get out of my face. Susan steps out and sees that Trish is physically close to Alex and that she is blocking the hallway. Several, several residents are standing around them. Trish, this conversation is over. You're in Alex's physical space and blocking the hallway. The staff explained the house rules to you when you got there. This is unacceptable. I want you to talk to your counselor tonight. Picking on someone else is disrespecting everyone in the program and the staff. Everyone, you have things you should be doing. Go do them. Once the hall clears out, Susan checks in with Alex to see how they're doing and to underscore that the shelter wants this to be a safe environment for them and for everyone staying there. Susan reminds Alex that recognizing and expressing gender identity is Alex's choice and assures them that they are welcome at the shelter, regardless of their decision to disclose or not disclose any part of their identity. Okay, so what went right with uh, protecting and supporting non-discrimination and confidentiality is that Susan upholds the project rules. Uh, she intervenes quickly to stop Trisha's verbal and physical harassment. So she was close by, she was present, she heard, and she intervened. She also preserves the confidentiality because again, Alex um, is still exploring and they haven't disclosed it to anyone else. So um, she gave the opportunity for a private conversation later to discuss the impact and support their safety. She promotes uh, the non-discrimination uh, because she really makes sure that all of those clients that heard and witnessed understood that that verbal and physical bullying aren't allowed, that it violates the project rules, um, that she asked uh, her to meet with her counselor that night, and that it really shows disrespect to the entire community. She also then discusses safety concerns 
with the client and recognizes Alex's right to access services for which they're eligible regardless of their gender identity or where they're at um, with exploring that. The one thing I will say to you actually about this example um, is not related to this. I'll say this first and then we'll go back. Um, a client may initiate a discussion with staff regarding the inaccurate perception of another client's gender expression um, and say that it threatens their health and safety. So you may have an all women shelter, have someone say that having a lesbian on premise makes them feel unsafe. Um, it's really important to educate the client and maintain all of the client's confidentiality. So we're not discussing specifically the client that's a lesbian at the shelter. Um, we'll really discuss the priorities of the project, which is to offer um, support to folks that need it. We're serving everyone that's eligible and that we're reinforcing that the staff and the agency are responsible for safety and that we ensure that eligible clients are enrolled and really then have them focus on their own progress and getting them their plan to move out of shelter. And so um, making sure that in those moments in which a client is using someone's gender or sexuality as a reason that they shouldn't have access to the shelter, we're not disclosing that client's sexuality or gender. We're not making it about them. Um, we're reinforcing our agency policies and we're reinforcing that our goal is to provide that client an option to, to leave the shelter, to move out, to have the next step. Um, and so making sure that, that we're mindful of that. One, the other thing I forgot to say back here was um, it is also not common um, for this one that anyone is expected to have their gender shared with anyone. And so in this example, or also, I forgot to mention it, it was actually related to this example. So HUD discourages greatly having to have identification as a prerequisite to in taking out a shelter. So it's just a note that while this example shows the ID, that's that's ideally not the way that you're in taking a client because we know a lot of reasons why folks don't have IDs. Um, okay, so I meant to say that. I was like, I can't remember if it was this one or that one. Okay, so the fifth floor is privacy and safety. We'll go through this because we're running out of time. Individual, individual actions. For privacy is during intake, we're candidly discussing honestly the safety and privacy of our shelter and letting the client guide you on what they want. So we're telling them about the sleeping arrangements. We're talking to them about what showering looks like or the bathroom setup or how staff is present or not present at certain hours or what, what that looks like for safety. We're safety planning disclosures, we're safety planning, um, the fact that they may or may not have someone within the community that um, may, may harass them. We're doing all of that safety planning and making sure that we're talking to them about it during intake. For the room accommodations, we want to give folks all of the options that are available to them. So when bringing a client into a shelter that is LGBTQ or has voiced concerns about privacy, we can offer them a room that's close to workstations. We can offer them uh, a room that we set aside 
that is just for folks with increased vulnerability um, that provides accommodations, but it's not just restricted for LGBTQ clients. Um, we're kind of giving them all of the different room setups and giving them the autonomy to choose the one that makes them feel the safest. After going through intake, um, it's not a good fit. We're doing everything in our power to ensure that we're giving them and identifying an alternative project that has vacancies um, so that we can make sure that we don't have someone that is unhoused continuing to be unhoused as the solution. We're also, as a strategy of a last resort, always an option. We could offer them a comparable hotel or motel voucher. Um, it's very good to understand HUD rules around that um, and just best practices of making sure that if you offer something like that, that they get all of the same comparable services so they get to stay the same amount of time you would offer them at shelter, that they have the same access to all of the program services you may offer if they end up staying at a hotel or motel, um, and that you're still providing them all the same level of care if that's your last resort option. Bathroom accommodations, you're going to want to establish that single use bathroom. Um, having this one that's at certain times of the day that can be scheduled by any client to request. Um, ensuring that toilet and shower stalls have locking doors or at minimum curtains. Uh, it's really also a very good idea for just safety overall is to implement potentially um, a schedule if there are only communal shower showers available. Of course, the big dream is to enhance our facilities in creating residential rooms that can be connected or separated via locked doors um, and having smaller private rooms as needed. Um, that offers a lot of different options for individuals and families alike. And so it, of course, that's the dream for all of us. And then also creating gender neutral individual bathrooms and individual showers um, when you're thinking about potentially applying for new grants or redoing facilities. The bigger picture stuff that we can do once we get our equal, assess equal access assessment, we feel like our foundations are set, we feel like we got our building done, is we're thinking about what we can do beyond. And so we're thinking about creating a buddy program for LGBTQ clients, accessing services would be a really great add-on. Um, so having volunteers and staff that go with clients to appointments, when we know that harassment often occurs, it gives them an opportunity to have someone that goes along with them to support them when they're seeking maybe medical care for the first time in years. And then also a program on which those volunteers and staff could connect them with broader community resources that they may be nervous to reach out to. Also attending and sponsoring or leading LGBTQ events in the community uh, is a really powerful way to show that you are actively involved and care about the community. Um, it also is a really great, great way. We know that word of mouth is the primary way that LGBTQ people uh, end up choosing to seek services. Um, there's really great studies done about particularly um, LGBTQ survivors of domestic violence and them seeking services, and it is almost exclusively through word of mouth. And so being out in the community is such a powerful way to make sure that people know that you exist and that you're affirming services. Attending and sponsoring um, events, but also leading intersectional advocacy efforts, or at least participating in them. Um, we know that intersectionality uh, means so many different things, but when we're living in a state where we have a legislative session every other year, we have a lot of things to get to during particularly our legislative session, but um, all year, round with uh, everything from local advocacy at your city council, school boards, um, participating in uh, 
committees and being a part of making sure that everything from healthcare to education to access to resources um, that we're advocating for them. Individual actions, we're gonna think about volunteering for LGBTQ organizations. There is no better way to support a community than to be involved in the community. And one of the um, most structured ways to get involved is to volunteer. And so um, looking up a way to, to, to connect to an LGBTQ organization, also participating in that advocacy efforts, reading, listening, and watching LGBTQ media, and then recognizing that um, allyship is a verb. I can't, I, we do not have time to watch this video, but we'll send it out as well, but it is a wonderful video about allyship being uh, something that we practice and live every day. Uh, and so making sure that, that you, are, you are living it. So I know that it's been a quiet group, but I would love if folks would feel like putting in the chat one thing that they're walking away with today or um, leaving the space with today. I would love to hear whether it's a feeling or something that um, you want to act on or do as an individual or an agency. Um, oh my gosh, please go decorate our office. Um, but anything that maybe speaks to you right now as an action that you would want to, to do from our time together today. As people type that in, because I know that that also takes a second to, to not only think about what you're going to, you want to do, but then also uh, type, type it out. Um, I'm going to put up my email for y'all. I love to hear that um, your program and agency is in the right, going in the right direction. That is the best, best thing to hear. So I'm, I'm glad you're feeling that way. Um, and thank you. I'm so glad that you exist in our community and I can't wait to see you at the conference. And yeah, I want to, I feel like volunteering really, it fills up my cup, particularly during really hard times of the world and just thinking, um, it, it lets me remind me that good people are out there too, by connecting with other people that are volunteering. And I'm glad this gets helped. Thanks uh, for our Oscar award winning, uh, actors today. Okay, y'all, so we'll follow up with an email. It's gonna include everything from um, a Google Drive with the assessment information, other resources available, PDFs to these recordings, the whole nine yards, um, always available to chat and um, be there for y'all as you have questions. I know that it's ever-changing landscape here. So I appreciate y'all caring and wanting to do this work and, and wanting to do right by our neighbors. Um, so thank you for being who you are and doing the work you do. I, very grateful you exist. Um, I'll stay around, we'll stop recording, but I'll stay around for a couple of minutes in case someone has a question they wanna stay off uh, recording.